Hi guys, welcome to this new module. Time to set up Office 365 for Sam and Rita. Sam and Rita's business have been going well. They have two offices, they have two domain controllers. All the group policies, two file servers which is getting replicated by DFS. Also, they set up an exchange server for their corporate email services. However, now having all this IT is becoming a problem for them. They have to pay a lot of money to IT service company to maintain all this IT infrastructure. They have upgraded their IT infrastructure every few years or so. Sometimes new servers needs to be purchased or other time it is a software upgrade. So they started with Exchange 2013 but then they had to install Exchange 2016 because 2013 was getting outdated so they had to buy new licenses. Also there is not a lot of high availability. Uh, in the infrastructure and there are a lot of single point of failure because they have only set up a single exchange server they don't want to set up multiple exchange server in a DAG and the high availability is uh, like a pain point for them if one of the server goes down then their services can then get disrupted so they're not very happy with this problems which they have. Sam discussed the concern with their IT service provider and the service provider suggested him to set up Office 365 for their business. He explained that Office 365 is a software as a service and can take care of below problems for them. No servers or hardware costs so they don't have to purchase any servers or any other hardware to maintain the infrastructure. The cost will be billed per user so there is no upfront license cost, there is no upfront deployment cost and they will get billed for the number of users. So if they have 10 users today they can get billed for 10 users but if they get 20 users or 30 users or 100 users tomorrow they can get billed for those many users. The benefit is that if they are getting so many users then definitely their business is improving and if business is improving they can pay more money for the IT. There is no infrastructure management cost so the IT service provider don't have to uh, patch the servers, they don't have to upgrade the exchange servers, they don't have to uh, perform a periodic reboot of the Windows server. Like a Windows server gets uh, kind of uh, slow and cached up if you keep it on for a very very long amount of time like if you don't reboot a server for 30 days or 40 days or for two months it sometimes gets slow and there uh, some problems gets created in it so a usual solution is that you have to reboot the server every 30 days or 40 days or so so uh, they don't have to do that in a cloud and there is excellent high availability there is uh, the data is getting replicated across multiple regions of Azure from Australia to US from Japan to India everywhere their data is getting replicated so they don't have to be concerned about high availability he also confirmed that Office 365 can provide a customer with Office and cloud it will provide them with the latest version of Microsoft Office so they don't have to purchase uh, office licenses uh, for their computer. The Word, Excel, PowerPoint suite and the Outlook suite that will all delivered with Office 365 and they can use that to set up their client PCs. Every user will get a 50 GB mailbox and along with that they will also get a 50 GB of archive mailbox. Essentially that means that they will get a 100 GB mailbox with every license. So that's a lot of space for a user. To give you an example, uh, if you go to your Gmail you have been using it for so uh, long amount of time if you go there most of your Gmail account will be around at 8 GB or 12 GB or 15 GB at most if you are heavy users. I have worked with some of the lawyers and they have got really heavy mailboxes but the biggest mailbox for an individual user which I have seen is around 40 uh, GB or 45 GB. So usually an end user mailbox doesn't grow that much uh, but with 50 GB mailbox and 50 GB archive you are getting 100 GB of storage. It. Believe me, it will take a lifetime to fill up that mailbox. In addition to that, Office 365 gives 1 TB of OneDrive storage or a personal cloud storage to every user. So you can use that as a file server or your personal home folder. And then you also get the collaboration suite of SharePoint where again you get 1 TB of storage for the whole company. Uh, once again, you can configure that as a file server uh, in your environment and you can put your files on it. You also get uh, Microsoft Teams which is a successor to Skype for Business which was a successor to Link. 
uh, which was derived from Office Communicator on-premise. I told you in the evolution of Office 365. So you're getting Teams now. Teams is an excellent collaboration solution and especially now that Sam have users in Manila and in uh, Los Angeles. So those users can do video calling to each other. They can do communication with either, each other. They can do screen sharing sessions with each other. So Teams is an amazing collaboration solution. Sam liked the idea and now Contoso is going to sign up for Office 365 services. So that's what we are going to do in this module. So here is what we are going to cover in this module. We are going to sign up an Office 365 account for Contoso. We are going to add their public domain which we purchased for their emails when we were setting up their exchange server. So we are going to set up that public domain uh, in Office 365 so that their users can have uh, their email address as username at contoso.com or whatever email domain you purchased. We are going to create users in Office 365 uh, so that you can see how you set up user accounts in Office 365. Then I'm going to show you the various administrative consoles of Office 365. I told you Office 365 there are so many components from security and compliance to productivity from teams to exchange and then Azure Active Directory so I'm going to show you all those administrative console and then in this module we are going to take a deep dive into exchange online admin console and you are going to find it exactly same as the exchange administrative console which you have already seen in the last module or the last week so yeah, it's going to be fun and I hope it's going to be very easy because like I said, you have already done the hard work. Okay, so this is the first section and we are going to do an Office 365 sign up. So what we are going to do here is, first of all, I'm going to explain you the type of licenses which are available for Office 365 and then we will go ahead and sign up a trial. So in Office 365, there are basically three kind of uh, users. Office 365 wants to cater to home user and to home user they provide home based licenses which basically just provide them with one terabyte of cloud storage plus it provides them with the latest version of Office like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, etc. It does not give them SharePoint, it does not give them Exchange Server, it does not give them Teams, etc. So they basically just get the home versions of things. Then there is a small business or business version of it which are a little cheaper licenses. They have got a lot of functionalities in them but they are little less in the security and compliance part of uh, Office 365. And then finally there are enterprise licenses which are the the Bentley or the uh, the Ferrari of the Office 365 world and there are multiple licenses available. They offer the best in class productivity as well as compliance and security features which the users can use. So let's go ahead and have a look at the licenses to begin with. So let's start looking for Office 365 licenses. And compare plans for Microsoft Home. So this is the home based licenses. So look here, these are Office 365 family plan. You pay $129 a year. Then Microsoft 365 personal plan where you pay $99 a year. And then there is Office uh, Home and Student 2019, which is $199. And this is a one-time purchase. You don't have to pay every year. Now in the one-time purchase, you only get Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. So this is especially for home and students, but you don't have to pay again and again. Here uh, in the personal module, you get Office, the whole version and plus you get OneDrive, one terabyte storage and you get Skype for business and this is only for one person and hence it is $99 and here Office 365 for family you get $129 a year and you get the office suits for all the users so it is up to six people in a family they can have it uh, all the six computer can have the office suit installed on it they can get the services like OneDrive and Skype for business for communication and it is compatible with the iOS and Android etc uh, it has uh, listed some of the features which are available so you can go ahead and have a look at them uh, this is basically the home plans then we go to the business plans 
The business plans, they have recently been uh, renamed. Earlier, they used to be called as Office 365. Now, they have been uh, called as Microsoft 365. So, there are a few licenses which are available. Uh, this is uh, a 365 Business Basic, 365 Business Standard, 365 Business Premium, and 365 Apps for Business. So, these are the prices on annual commitment. So, what basically Microsoft means by annual commitment is that if you go ahead and purchase this license, you're kind of committed to the license for the duration of the whole year and if you remain committed then you will pay six dollars and ninety cents every month however some people go ahead and cancel their subscription in the first few months or whatever and in those cases microsoft just takes a little extra payment from you and maybe it will be uh, seven and a half dollars or uh, 19 dollars or something in this case and uh, yeah but other than that uh, you basically can cancel the service uh, whenever but if you want to use the discounted price then keep the subscription alive for the whole year now what you get in business basic is exchange onedrive sharepoint and teams you're not getting the office suit you do get the office web version so basically you can open uh, word in your web browser you can open outlook over in your web browser you can open excel in your web browser uh, so uh, word excel and powerpoint are included mobile and web version but the installation of local office is not available the second plan is uh, business standard which is uh, $17 so you get the uh, version for your PC and once again a user can have multiple PCs he can have a PC at home he can have a PC at work he can have uh, a mobile device or something so you get uh, up to five installation of office on uh, users computer and uh, some companies even use uh, the five installation to install office on multiple users pc with the same license but then the problem is that uh, each user let's say that uh, you have a admin or a owner by the name sam and you use his license to install office on everybody's computer then everybody in their word excel and powerpoint will be able to see the recent file which are being used by sam so that's a kind of a, a problem but some businesses do that uh, you get exchange online onedrive sharepoint and teams and uh, these are the additional detail of features which are available and then this is the premium version of the license in this you get this you get this and in addition to that you get Intune which is a uh, software in cloud uh, which you use to control your mobile devices it is I would say a replacement to group policies uh, this is called as modern management so you can install Intune client on your users computer and your mobile devices and you can put a lot of policies and controls using Intune admin panel so that's included and then you get in Azure information protection this is a data security plan uh, with which you can uh, protect a lot of data in your organization and uh, so advanced threat protection is a email security help protects against sophisticated threat hidden email attachment links remote wipe company data from lost and stolen devices restrict copying and saving company information on unauthorized apps so you may want to save uh, or protect users or prevent users from copying the emails on their personal computer or taking a printout of the email so you can do those things with this it's a very very highly useful uh, solutions which are coming under advanced threat protection and uh, the intune so you can control all these uh, pc and uh, computers which are not part of a uh, active directory domain so what happens is smaller businesses now that they are getting office 365 services there is no point for them to maintain an on-premise active directory server and without the active directory server is there is no group policies no control so what Intune does is like even if you have a three users company you can install an Intune subscription and you can put policies and control on the users computers and phones so that you can protect your corporate data so these are the business license now there are also enterprise licenses and these are e3 license look at the price this is directly 46 dollars and uh, you get office apps word excel powerpoint you get email and calendar you get uh, teams you get social and internet yammer and sharepoint you are getting you're getting onedrive stream and sway uh, you're getting task management using power apps uh, power automate planner 
to do you are getting advanced analytics using power bi and pro uh, you have got device management you can see that some of them are not fully available so there is like a light check mark on it let me read what does that mean if partially included so they are like partially included these features uh, then there is a e5 license this is a big daddy of licenses and uh, here you get all these features and security threat protection information protection security management a lot of a lot of granular controls included uh, with your license it's a very expensive license not a lot of companies will be able to afford it but then it's a highly highly secured license and microsoft is uh, making these licenses worth because whatever features you see here it's not like a right click deploy for them and they're just taking free money from you they have to install a lot of hardware a lot of software in office 365 data centers to provide these services to you the best thing is a small business who has five users can never afford to install all these services by themselves manage and maintain them whereas with office 365 if there are two users or three users in the company but they want enterprise grade services like any fortune 500 or fortune 1000 company they can buy e5 license and use those services then you also get an f3 license which is like a frontline license so if you have got like pizza delivery boys or shift workers or factory workers who don't need access to a lot of things but they need uh, partial access to services like just emails they need or they need access to some of the software offerings which Microsoft is giving so uh, those things become available uh, with the F1 license or the frontline license so this is the cheapest one at $13.70 so these are the options which are available to you and these are the three kind of licenses which comes with the office 365 and of course when you are choosing uh, what licenses you want to go with you have to look at the features and functionalities which are available and then you have to uh, go ahead and choose the correct license for you i would tell you that um, most of the customers which we have we recommend them to go with the business licenses uh, because the business licenses pretty much provide you a lot of things but of course security if it is on your mind then enterprise licenses are the best option for you okay let's go ahead and sign up a trial for office 365 so uh, let's go ahead and sign up an enterprise trial why not okay so Enterprise is not giving us an option to sign up a trial, although there are options available and I'm sure if I go in my partner portal, then from there I would be able to start a trial for um, Enterprise as well, but uh, you won't have access to that. So what I'm going to do is that I'll go to the business plans and business plans gives me an option to try it free for one month. So I will go ahead and choose this. All right, so let's set up an account. I'm already signed up with one of my accounts, so I would say log out and create a new account. If you already have a Microsoft account, you can use that or I suggest that you actually go ahead and sign up a new account all the time because uh, it makes more sense. So I would say Shashar Chandravat and this is an email address which I can provide for myself so I'll say okay it's not letting me do that so I have already signed out so I'll just close it and I will go once again to office 365 licenses And I'll go to business, go to try. So it's saying uh, set up your account. So I'm going to give it an email address. 
I'll give some dummy email address so that it asks me to set up a new one. If I'll give it my Microsoft email address and by Microsoft I mean even my Hotmail address so it will start using that. I don't want that to happen and guys I'm not going to actually sign up a trial because I have got too many trials to manage already. I'm just going to give you uh, like a demo how you can do it. I'll leave it on the last step. So gh at msmi.com so basically it didn't find it so it's going to ask me to create new so share chintravak or I'll, I'll basically john doe and then the telephone number so we'll say plus six one four five eight eight nine six three two five this is not my telephone number then and it also knows that 408 252028 4, 3, 4, 9, 9, 2, 3, 3, 2. Come on. What's the problem? Okay. So pledge to you your company size so it doesn't matter what you choose here because it's ultimately number of licenses which you buy this is just an information which they are trying to collect and then the region you have to be very very careful about selecting your region because this region is uh, the currency in which you will get billed and when you sign up a trial for Office 365 or when you sign up a tenant for Office 365, the users in different geographies. So even if I sign up one trial in Australia, user across the globe can use it. In fact, when I'm creating a user, if I know that some of my user lives in uh, USA or some of them lives in Japan or India. So while creating the user, you will see that I have an option to provide a location for them. What's going to happen is that their mailbox will reside uh, on a uh, mailbox database server, which is local to them in their country but it is very important for me to choose the correct region for the billing purposes if I choose incorrect region the region cannot be changed it happened with us that once initially in around 2012 we were signing up uh, an office 365 for somebody and we actually did the whole migration for them and set up everything one thing which we didn't notice that it was a US customer and we when we were signing up the trial by mistake we chose India here and when we do who did that then uh, everything worked fine it was just that their billing was coming in indian currency and we couldn't have uh, done that like we the customer couldn't have used that so that was wrong so we actually had to do an office 365 to office 365 migration to get out of that situation because it is not possible for you to change the region once you have signed up so always always make sure that you choose the correct region Okay, so it's going to ask me to put a verification code here. All right, so I validated my telephone number. Now in this step, what we have to do is that we have to uh, choose a tenant domain. So whereas in Office 365, you can have your email ending with your personal domain like uh, mybusiness.com or contoso.com or pledgetechnologies.com whatever you want but when you are signing up a tenant you have to understand that you are uh, joining a community where there are multiple tenants already so you need to create a unique identity for yourself uh, in this world of Microsoft so that unique identity is tenant.com or this uh, unique identity is your tenant domain so like say I say contoso.com most likely not available it is not available contoso23.com not available contoso2301.com is available okay so you can choose anything like for our businesses I would always uh, uh, chosen something like pledgetech dot on Microsoft so we want to try to keep it as relevant to as our business possible but it is quite uh, possible that uh, uh, your business domain name what you want to 
have as a tenant domain is not available here so it doesn't matter what you choose here it's just that uh, sometimes you might need to remember this uh, uh, tenant domain name at certain places you might have to put this tenant information not very often so uh, it's good that you choose something usable but uh, Otherwise, this is not something which you really need to worry about. So I would suggest that you go ahead and choose whatever you like to. And now it is going to ask you to create the first admin account. So what I do is that I always create the admin account with this name, tenant admin. This is the first global administrator account of your Office 365 tenant. And this is a tenant account with which we are going to log in and we are going to uh, set up our services. So always uh, uh, keep this account as is, keep its password safe. In future, if you may have to use it and yeah, you can create more administrative account in future uh, in your tenant, but this is going to be the first account. And you go sign up it's asking you the number of licenses which you want so it is going to be free for now for the first 30 days I would still suggest that you take one or two licenses only because in case you forget to sign up uh, in case you forget to um, reduce the license or cancel the subscription you might get charged so try with the most limited licenses possible all right, so this step, uh, Microsoft asks you to put your uh, credit card and debit card details, which they will use after 30 days to take your payment. If you cancel uh, before 30 days, you will not be charged any payment. So make sure that you cancel it. Earlier, it was really good that they did not use to ask us for this uh, credit card. And uh, I reckon because of that, a lot of people signed up a lot of tenants. And uh, that's not something which is uh, very... Uh, highly comfortable for them to keep managing and that's why I believe they have added this hindrance. So because I want to give you a total experience, I'm going to sign up a tenant here and I will cancel it shortly. Uh, so let me go ahead and put my card details here and go to the next level. Okay. Right. So I have put in my card details and uh, it is activating my trial. Okay, so this is my trial and I can log in to this and I'll just go to my setup. So because they are making Office 365 really simple for people, so they start, uh, so they have started giving you this wizard where you can go ahead and start setting up everything really quickly and basically even an end user can go ahead and set it up if they want to. Uh, but what we are going to do is we are going to do the exit uh, from here so that we can reach to the admin panel and uh, we are going to start all our work here. All right, so having said that, okay, so we have signed up our trial. Let's go back to the training and see what's next. So we have uh, signed up the trial. Now we are going to start setting up our Office 365 tenant. So here is what we are going to do. Uh, the first thing which you have to do is we have to set up a business domain because we want our emails to be at our business name.com and here is why and how we do it. So we come here and we do show all then we go to settings and then we go to domain and guys just a FYI <laughs> Microsoft keep changing this admin panel way too much. So 
sometimes you will have to find your way around things they keep changing the uh, the way and the layout of this in an attempt to make it better for the first few days it looks really difficult to find around things and you somehow think that Microsoft it was very good already why do you keep changing it but yeah they have to do it and they keep doing it so get used to of looking for things in different direction but anyways for now the domains are here you go ahead and say add domain and then you put your business domain here whatever the name of your domain is contoso business.com and you say use this domain Now what Microsoft is asking you here is to add a TXT record in your domain's public DNS record. Where is the public DNS record? It is with GoDaddy or whoever is your domain registrar. You go into that public DNS record and you create a text record and you add the value of text record. So it's basically asking you how do you want to validate the domain by adding a text record. If you can't add a text record then add a dummy MX record. So you can do that. or you can add a text file to the domain website. So it will give you a file and you can put it in the hosting uh, root of your website, wherever your website is hosted. Now, we usually use the TXT record method. They only provide the alternate method because there are some DNS providers, some domain registrar from whom if you buy the domain, they don't provide the functionality of adding a TXT record. I know it's strange, but a uh, lot of DNS providers don't let us do that. So anyways, so we usually use the TX3 record method. What we do is that we go ahead to the next step and then it gives us the value. So it basically is saying at, at means uh, that you don't have to put anything in the DNS. And let me, let me quickly. So what I have done here is that I have logged into my uh, GoDaddy domain the DNS and uh, I'll just quickly show you how to do it here. But um, remember guys, all our domains are already validated on Office 365 and I have not purchased a new domain for the purpose of this training. So I would not be able to do the actual validation for you, but I will just go ahead and show you how to do it to the best of my ability. So. Okay, so this is my DNS record. What it is asking me to do is to add and select a TXT here. And then what is the name of this record? The name of this record is at or skip if not provide uh, uh, if this if not supported by the provider. So sometimes providers support you to put at I, I reckon GoDaddy let you do that. So you can put at here at basically means that we are creating the DNS record at the root of it. So the root of this domain is grishby.com. When I create any DNS record, let's say sip. So it becomes sip.grishby.com shop.grishby.com mail.grishby.com. Let's assume I don't want to do that. What I want to do is that I want to create a record at the root of it. That is at grishby.com level. So I put at here. The second thing which it is asking me is to put this here. What I'll do is I will, I will try to add uh, my business domain here. Most likely it's not going to let me do it, but because grishby.com most likely is already set up with our office 365. So I reckon it's going to give one such error message to us. Mm, no, it's giving me an option to set it up. So I go ahead and do this. So it's asking me to put this TXT record value. <clears throat> this is strange. Anyways. How can they have krishmi.com at two places? But, and then last one is the time to live value of a DNS record. So 
TTL value of a DNS record, you will e even see it in your uh, local uh, Active Directory DNS which you have. Uh, basically your Active Directory DNS and uh, the public DNS in terms of functionality and principles they are exactly same. It's just that you are running that DNS in your local internal domain and this is in a public domain but otherwise they have same kind of DNS record, same kind of values, everything is same. Principle behind them, the fundamentals behind them are exactly the same. So uh, TTL is the time to live. Uh, which means that when a client caches the information of this DNS record uh, for the next one hour because the TTL is one hour if uh, the computer needs the information again it will not go to the DNS server so the DNS server has said that this value is very good up till next one hour so you don't have to come back to me again and again if in next one hour you need the response to the same name resolution again okay so you can do it half hour one hour or you can do custom you can even reduce it to I don't know 60 seconds or something so yeah uh, but ideally everybody does it for one hour which is fine so we'll leave it there Okay, it didn't let me add it, so I'll just go ahead and do it once again. I don't know why it's not letting me add it. Okay, so I go ahead and do save. So this DNS record got added here and then I'm going to verify. So it is saying that it, it couldn't find the DNS record which we have added. The reason for that is that uh, these are public DNS records, okay? God knows where this DNS server is located and really God knows where this Office 365 tenant is located. For all that we know, this could be in Australia and this could be in America. So there are global differences time I'm not saying I'm uh, talking about the difference in the time and once again like I have told you there is no difference in time there is only difference in time zone ultimately the time is same which is the UTC time or London time so um, but there are geographical differences and when you saved this information uh, on a DNS server let's say in USA this information need to get replicated to multiple DNS server across the globe and as soon as it reaches to a DNS server to which this uh, office 365 is looking towards then it will validate the domain for us okay so now it has given this error message to me that we cannot add this to this tenant because this domain is already added to a different office 365 tenant which is very good and this is basically asking that you need to talk to shishar at pleasuretechnologies.com to find out uh, what can be done with this domain so i couldn't add this domain and unfortunately i don't have any public domain but if you have a public domain you can go ahead and validate it here and uh, that's it uh, once you do that then your domain will start showing up here like it is showing incomplete setup incomplete setup so it will show healthy here and you have to make sure that your domain shows healthy there are two things which you have to do number one you have to validate your domain and once you have validated your domain then it will give you some DNS records which you need to create. Those DNS records will be for various services. You will have to create DNS records for uh, MX record so that you can point your MX record to Office 365 MX record for email delivery. Like uh, you can go here and look. Uh, MX is pointing to grishpi-mail.protection.outlook.com so whatever your domain name is that will come in front and then at the back of it it would be uh, mail.protection.outlook.com which is the office 365 then you might have to create this uh, SIP records for your uh, team uh, we used to create it for Skype for Business I reckon the same are being used for Teams but might have to create that I will go ahead and delete this record and as a matter of fact even if you validate your domain you still have an option to uh, delete these records and uh, there is no harm in deleting them because once the domain is validated that means uh, it's validated they just asked you to add a domain or validate the domain because they wanted to make sure that you own the domain because uh, in all possibility what I can do here is that I can 
can say uh, uh, go ahead and add citibank.com or microsoft.com or or uh, westpac.com here and uh, i can start sending email as westpac and essentially i'll be using microsoft office 365 infrastructure to spam and loot people that will be wrong so they need to validate that you own this domain and that's how you validate the domain once again you have uh, once you have added your all the dns records and all the domains here uh, and your domain is healthy then you can move to the next step i will sincerely recommend you to do this setup again you can sign up a office uh, a domain on godaddy it's really simple uh, and it's very cheap you might even find uh, some cheaper domains uh, as well there are there is a website called as cheap domains they probably uh, give it to you name cheap or cheap domains they they can give you domains really really cheap so for the first year uh, i reckon you can uh, get it for as less as maybe 10 15 dollars yeah, so .com.au or dot, just buy whatever is cheapest for you. So this is available for $15 for the year. So maybe just buy the domain and, and uh, uh, this way you can have a full experience. Uh, here it's saying for $15.95 for the first year. So you can go ahead and try that. So you'll have a complete experience. So I suggest you do that. Okay, so we have validated your business domain. I showed you how to add a domain and I showed you how you can validate by adding uh, the text record. Next, we are going to create user accounts. It's very simple. Microsoft has given a very, very simple panel. You can start creating directly from here in the dashboard, but uh, what I would suggest is you go here uh, under active users and you say add user. Yep, so Sam Doe. Yeah, I, I couldn't think of a better name. So Sam Doe, we haven't thought about the last name for Sam yet. So Sam, and then if you would have added a domain, validated a domain, you will get an option to choose that domain from here so that he can have the username, not at the tenant domain name, but in the actual business domain name. Then you get an option to auto-generate the password or create one. You can choose whatever you want to, whichever one which you want to, and you can go ahead and set up some kind of a password here. And uh, then you say, uh, send the password in an email. So if you want to send a password to, uh, Sam on his uh, Gmail address then you can do that here okay uh, I forgot what's the password so I'll just go ahead and do that next it is asking you what kind of license you want to give to the user so you can say without a license or if you have multiple type of licenses you can choose so maybe you have a uh, business premium license or you have a e3 license or you have a frontline license and depending on the role of the user you can go ahead and choose what license you want to give to them or you can choose to create a user without a license for now and then you can choose the location of the user now remember i told you that the users can be across the globe and it doesn't matter as long as you have signed up the tenant in the correct region the billing will happen in that region users can be anywhere uh, they want to be and they will be serviced by the closest uh, data center location and the mailbox server to them here you get the apps which are available for uh, this license so if i go ahead and do this there are no apps available if I go ahead and give this these apps are available so if you want to go ahead and certain disable certain apps for the user you can do that and uh, remember I told you like there are so many things which Microsoft is giving you uh, so yeah you you can uh, go ahead and maybe you don't want to give certain apps to the user so you can say uh, disable this disable this disable this disable this look even windows 10 license uh, is getting part of this so you don't even want uh, to buy a license for windows you can get the license of windows on rent as well so uh, this is a very value for money offering so you can go ahead and choose what what apps you want to give to the user what you don't want to give to the user and you can just uh, do this and uh, yeah so next 
Uh, here you can choose if you want to give uh, user an administrative access. So there are multiple level of access which are available. So you can make a user global admin. Global admin is the most powerful access which is available. It basically means that the user is going to be admin in all the admin panels and he is an overall admin. So either you can make the user a global admin uh, like Sam being the owner of the company he may want to become that or if the user is a support user and they specifically support exchange then you can make them exchange admin if they are uh, only the help desk user so help desk user have a right to reset the password of the user so you can give them help desk right it is very important that you give the correct rights to people because uh, it's quite easy that you can make everybody global admin and most of them will be able to work just fine but the problem with that is that there are stupid people and you can't give access of your whole organization uh, to everybody let's say there is a level one guy who has joined you last month and you give him global admin and he is uh, uh, so I'll give global admin to Sam for now and uh, yep so it's basically confirming everything and we're going to finish it so now wh what happens is that you you gave global admin rights to uh, the user and uh, what he did he came here and the first thing which he did was he went ahead and deleted this domain from here or removed this domain from here because he's a new user. It's not his mistake. It's your mistake that you made him global admin. So you have to be really granular with the kind of rights which you are going to give to your people. So Sam Doe, uh, John Doe got created. Sam Doe got created. Okay, very good. Uh, if you want to add more users, you can follow the same process for Rita and uh, maybe not make her admin. So I'll just quickly do this Rita and display name uh, Rita Doe and Rita Doe and Rita and uh, you can use whatever policy you want to use first name dot last name just first name and uh, I'll say auto generate the password and uh, don't email the password and uh, force them to reset the password the first time that they log in and then uh, the license then the optional settings so I'm not going to give any admin access to Rita and yeah that's it so we went ahead and created these users so all the users are available here you get uh, various options here so you can uh, filter the user based on all the global admins so it'll, it'll just show you the global admin users or you can filter the users uh, who are help desk admin or you can look for the users who are licensed users so maybe you are you have 100 users here but only 25 of them are licensed and you want to find out the list of 25 users who have licenses so you can choose that and it's giving you a quick interface here showing you the kind of license that the user have okay so let's go back to the training and see what we have done so we have created user and we have assigned license to the user that's it guys let's go to the next section so office 365 admin panels office 365 is a collection of multiple services and no matter how many services microsoft put under one big umbrella but the fact remains that they used to be their own technologies on premise so exchange was separate sharepoint was separate skype was separate sql was separate everything was separate so Microsoft has put everything all together under one big umbrella. So SQL is not under Office 365, but then there are so many other services. And now they exist in cloud altogether. But it should be seen as a data center which is hosting multiple technologies. And it should not be seen as one service that Office 365 is there and everything belongs to that. Office 365 is not a brand new technology. Like it's a new technology, but these are the same on-premise technologies which has graduated into Office 365. So for that reason, all these different technologies have their own admin panels. And there are different people ideally in big companies who are managing it so the guys who are managing sharepoint they are not managing exchange and the guys who are managing exchange they are not taking care of active directory because they require their own skills however uh, you need to have basic skills in all three of these areas and the best thing is that uh, now you don't have to manage the exchange server maintain the exchange server worry about exchange server database and those kind of things so it's pretty easy to do most of these things but uh, having the background knowledge about them is going to be a lot 
lot easier. So, like, I, I'll give you a straight up example. I did not cover SharePoint on premise installation, but because believe me, it used to be really horrible and hardly any company have on prem SharePoint available anymore. Everybody has moved to SharePoint online because it is easier to manage and maintain. So, when you are going to look at SharePoint admin panel, you are going to find it difficult. But if you did your Exchange installation well, and if you played around with Exchange well, Exchange admin panel is like a child's play for you. Uh, similarly, there is a OneDrive admin panel, which is uh, an extension to SharePoint. There is a Teams administrative panel. There is a security and compliance admin panel, and there is an Azure Active Directory admin panel. So we are going to have a look at all the admin panels which are there in uh, Office 365 now. So once again, we will go to Home. And I told you that this is where all the users are. Uh, this is uh, devices. If you have uh, Windows 10 machines joined to the domain, you will see them here. If you have created groups uh, or if you want to create groups in Office 365, they can show up here. Uh, shared mailboxes from Exchange, they can show up here. Uh, these are the roles. Uh, the global admin and the exchange admin they all show up here again microsoft is keep changing these panels uh, every now and then and believe me i i have never seen this roles panel here but i know internally how to reach out to it uh, you have got resources like room and equipment mailboxes so what microsoft is trying to do is in this dashboard they want you to be able to do everything and you as a L1 support or L2 support would be able to do a lot of things here. You can go and have a look at your billing here, the kind of money which you are paying and your invoices. If you want to open a support ticket with Microsoft, you can do it from here. And then you can add uh, domains here and you can do further setup like a guided setup here if you want to the the wizard which i cancelled in the beginning so all these things and if you want to do monitoring like a service health monitoring etc so those things are available here and you can look see there is few problems going on with exchange online that's why you are seeing it in the service health and if you go here to advisories they'll tell you that there are two issues any user may experience shared calendar update problems uh, something so this issue is started on July 23rd and this issue started on May 16th and this is the current status this issue is still in place this is an extended recovery and if you go here and click on it they'll show you all the updates which they have done on this issue so far and uh, you you basically remain up to date with this so uh, you can also report an issue if you are facing a problem from here and they will uh, if they find that uh, that problem exists then they'll probably update it here uh, you can set some kind of a preferences here and there's a message center where Microsoft keeps sending you messages if they are uh, stopping the support for certain services let's say they say that Skype is not going to be available in future so they will let you know the new features which are coming in Office 365 they are going to show you that so these kind of things all are available okay so having said that these are uh, the common Office 365 dashboard panels and they have become really good uh, as Office 365 is going uh, better and better. However, the real admin panels are here and you basically show all admin centers and you have got these It's very strange guys. It looks like that they have removed the admin centers. Where is the admin centers?
All right, so uh, there are all the admin centers. Sorry, they were missing. Uh, so there is a security admin center in which you can go and uh, do your security settings. So there's a security and compliance center. It's going to show up the settings. This is the endpoint manager, which is uh, a reduced version of Microsoft Intune. So look here, there are a lot of options which are available here. You can look at the alerts, you can create policies for alerts, what kind of alerts you want to get notified of. So you can create alert policies, suspicious email sending patterns. So if, if they, uh, so there is a lot of artificial intelligences in place now and Microsoft is uh, putting money in a lot of softwares in the back end, which you and I don't get to see. but these alerts are up as uh, a result of those and if if you see somebody sending a lot of suspicious email in your organization in an on-premise exchange installation it would be almost impossible for you to detect something like this whereas here you can create all kind of policies and you can set up an alert that uh, when something like this happen then you have to send email to these users you can go ahead and set uh, to what user you have to send the email and uh, Similarly, you can create more alert policies if you want to. So whatever the name uh, you want to give this alert and then the severity, uh, my alert, and then you select the severity medium and category DLP, and then you uh, look here, what is the alert activity, then you can choose. So once again, when you have to do these kind of a things, you can go deep and set up the alerts or you can read more and more about each admin panel and play around with it. So this is uh, one kind of alert. Once again, if I go in the detail of each and everything, this becomes like really difficult uh, to teach and very, very long to teach. I'll not be going in too much details, but these are the alerts which are available. Then these are the permissions actually uh, for the various things which people can do here so despite of being a global admin uh, for managing security risk and compliance center you need to have various permissions and uh, with time to time you will see that you will have to add yourself and give yourself more permissions like if you want to do e-discovery which is a topic which I'm going to cover um, during this uh, training so you have to give yourself e-discovery manager sort of a role so I will go ahead uh, and do this uh, already for me and uh, who so e-discovery administrator I will give it to myself so I have to do tenant admin I'm giving this guy e-discovery administrator And uh, compliance administrator is again one role which uh, you need sometimes to do a lot of things. But uh, yeah, you don't have to uh, really by heart what roles you need to do what. And these are role services which are available. So you can actually go and read the description of each available service. You can Google it. And even if you go ahead and edit these sections, you will see that uh, uh, the meaning of these services is available. And there is a brief description about this role which is given here. Uh, so member is none I will once again go ahead and add my John Doe user or the tenant admin user so so this is permission then you have got classification you can put and create labels uh, sensitivity labels for your organization this is part of data loss prevention you can put security policies uh, so uh, businesses create labels like confidential like uh, secured or non-confidential or general documents and what uh, happens is that uh, these labels they show up on all the uh, Microsoft Office platform Outlook and Word and Excel and you can quickly add a label to a document and then based on the policies how that label is supposed to be treated the document will let's say you mark it confidential uh, you mark an email confidential you send it to the whole company nobody will be able to forward that email 
these are like some high level technologies which Microsoft has used and they have put these data loss prevention solutions in the back end because of which we are able to achieve all this. Uh, now you might not be able to do it in a regular uh, uh, on-premise installation because you'll have to install so many softwares and so much of technology it becomes almost impossible to do this. So threat management you can set up uh, various kind of uh, policies against the threats and all that so that is again a compliance features which are available you can set up uh, mail flow or message trace uh, you can do e-discovery here you can create various kind of reports here so there is a lot of things which are available in security and compliance and these things have uh, like a bit different than the regular AD and exchange that we have done so far but these are self-explanatory things and if you read about them you will understand more and more security and compliance is very good topic for the people who want to grow in the security domain which is a highly rewarding and highly paying domain so if you want to go into that domain uh, make friends with this security and compliance center study more and more in it and then you will see there are a lot of peripheral technologies when I say peripheral technologies there are other companies who are doing this work semantic it is doing or uh, barracuda is doing or there are other companies who are providing solutions in security and compliance space so you will find their solutions as well so yeah this is the security and compliance center now you have the compliance uh, compliance is basically um, how compliant and secure your environment is. Uh, so compliant means that uh, you look here GDPR. This is the global uh, data uh, data management uh, principles, which are defined by Europe. Uh, this is HIPAA, which is a health industry professional certification. ISO 27001 is an IT certification. SOC1, FINRA, all these are global compliance, which Office 365 has already achieved. Uh, here it is giving you the compliance score for uh, yourself, the things which you can do. It uh, You can actually go ahead and have a look at various things and it will give you quick solutions which you can imply, uh, apply in your tenant to increase your compliance score so this is all about not making your solution uh, office 365 more productive for end user point of view but making it more secure and more compliant so there are policies available here for alert and data loss prevention and retention policies. So if you want to retain your data, I'm going to show you the retention policies. You can set up the retention policies here uh, to retain your data. And there are various settings available here for governance and uh, compliance, which you can do. Once again, a very deep topic and you might want to go through the various options which are available here play around the best thing is that because it is not your own infrastructure you cannot break it in most of the cases you can just play around with things and you'll be all right all right going back here endpoint manager is for microsoft intune i'm not going to go in the details of that azure active directory is uh, the Active Directory for Office 365 and for Azure Tenant as well. So, you can have a look at your users. The users which you created in Office 365, that, is, that was like creating the users from within Exchange Panel. Now you're looking at those users directly in Azure Active Directory. This is the Active Directory against which uh, the Exchange was installed and uh, these are all the users which are there if you delete a user it will show up and deleted user it's like a recycle bin you can restore the user from here so it's very simple if you want to reset the power of a, uh, the password of a user that's possible here and uh, there are a lot of things like uh, i told you that uh, there are third party single sign on options available so azure active directory is a platform uh, as service and what you can do is that you can use this service to sign in various third party applications so you can integrate those third party applications here how you do that is that 
there are so many applications let's say that you want don't want to sign into box yourself or with your local credential or for dropbox you don't want to use their credentials rather you want to use your office 365 active directory credentials so you can integrate dropbox with office 365 and then uh, they will be able to uh, you will be able to log into dropbox with your office 365 credentials you can set up salesforce salesforce is a crm solution which is used by a lot of companies so you can set up uh, uh, a big uh, Salesforce uh, uh, integration and uh, now people can log into Salesforce using their Active Directory service now. Uh, ServiceNow is once again an ITSM, IT service and management tool where people create ticket and engineers uh, resolve ticket and send notifications to the customer. So ServiceNow is highly utilized across the globe nowadays. So you can integrate ServiceNow. Once again, you don't have to use local credentials in ServiceNow, whereas you can use Azure Active Directory credentials. So a lot of these applications are available to be integrated and uh, then there are a lot more uh, like altogether, this there is like three, five, three, eight applications. And believe me, if you come here after one week, this will be maybe uh, 35, 50. Every day they add few more applications which can get integrated. And in fact, all these applications provider are also trying their level best to get integrated with Azure Active Directory. Look here, even in Amazon Web Services, you can integrate with Azure Active Directory so that you can log into Amazon Web Services using your Azure Active Directory tenant. So that's what is the power of active directory and uh, this active directory is not limited just to office 365 you can integrate other applications with it i will go to the exchange panel the last because uh, we have to uh, go deep in it i'll show you the sharepoint panel but once again we will be covering sharepoint in next module so this is the sharepoint administrative panel you can do a lot of things and then there is a OneDrive administrative panel, a separate panel uh, which you can manage from here. So there is a Teams panel which is available. So you can manage your Microsoft Teams settings from here. There used to be a Skype for Business panel as well, but like I said that I think uh, Skype for Business is no more available with the new tenants. So yeah, there are various settings and Teams which you can manage from here. All right, so those are all the admin panels which are available in Office 365 and you can go into all these admin panels to manage your Office 365. Let me tell you guys, in 99.9% .9 cases, um, junior engineers can just go ahead and create users and assign licenses and everything works like a clockwork. You don't have to go in the details or each and everything and these changes happen very very uh, rarely and they happen after careful consideration it's not that every morning you will come here and change a policy these are big decisions and the businesses take those decision very carefully and then they apply them so you're not going to be going in these admin panels every day to make changes 99 percent of the time your time will be spent using managing active users disabling users deleting users and doing those kind of things Okay, so I sh didn't show you Exchange Admin Panel. I showed you SharePoint Admin, OneDrive Admin, Teams, Security and Compliance Center, and Azure Active Directory. So let's go to the next module, which is Exchange Admin Panel. Now, in Exchange Admin Panel, I'm going to show you the same things which I have explained to you before. That is the User Mailbox, Shared Mailbox, Resource Mailbox, Mailbox Delegation, Distribution Groups, Exchange Rules, Spam Protection Settings. Remember, I was not able to show you Spam Protection Settings in Exchange 2013 because uh, Exchange 2013 needed me to uh, install another script to enable Spam Protection on it because by default it was disabled. I didn't do that, uh, do that and I asked you to do it. Uh, I presume you would have done it. Uh, but if you did not, then you can see the same settings on Office 365 here. I will also show you DKIM and SPF settings here and I will show you the exchange connectors here. All right, so this is my favorite exchange admin panel. Right, so this is the dashboard of Exchange Admin Panel and all the options which you are seeing here, these are the same options which you are seeing here. So you have got recipients under which you have got your mailboxes, your distribution groups, your resource mailboxes which are your equipment mailbox or room mailbox. You can create contacts. 
uh, you know contacts the people who are not the users of your company but you want them to be in your global address list so that your company employees can just put their name and resolve their name uh, don't have to remember their email addresses these are the shared mailboxes and the migration tab we will talk about it later then there are admin roles these are uh, roles similar to the uh, compliance roles which i showed you in security and compliance center so such roles are available here uh, compliance management again e-discovery can be done from here as well but uh, mostly we do e-discovery from the compliance center now uh, data loss prevention policies retention policies uh, these are the policies which are defined to create uh, or to retain the content of mailbox so retention policies are basically the policies which we create and we assign to user mailboxes so that if a user delete the emails from his mailbox even those emails can be recovered and uh, technically no data ever get deleted from office 365 if you put the right settings and whatever email has come into your environment will always be recoverable now these are the protection filters which I talked to you about. So DKIM is there, SPF is somewhere I'll show you, spam filter, malware filter, connection filter, all these things are available here. Uh, public folders are available here, I told you about. Unified messaging is available here if you want to use it. Uh, and hybrid is uh, once again a setup where on-premise exchange server runs along with uh, Office 365. So let's quickly go here and we'll look at the mailboxes. So when you create a user from the Office 365 admin panel and when you assign it a license, automatically an exchange mailbox gets created for him. Once again, these are the user mailboxes which got created. If you go here, they look exactly the same how they used to look in on-premise exchange server. Mailbox usage basically shows you how much mailbox is used. So out of 50 GB mailbox, 213 kilobyte is used so yeah so empty the contact information you can update the information here if you like you can also update this information from azure active directory and that information will start show up uh, showing up here because ultimately they are the same users once again organizational information email addresses if the user wants to have additional email addresses so you can give him those additional email addresses by typing them here mailbox features so you can assign the retention policy here you can assign an address book policy sharing policy role assignment policy uh, there is a lot of policies which are available you want to disable uh, the active sync for user so what's going to happen is that he will not be able to configure this mailbox on his phone if you do that if you want to disable outlook web access for users so these things are really uh, good if you want to restrict the user to be able to access the office 365 from outside uh, the office environment or you want him to be able to access the office 365 mailbox only from outlook not from his phone or over so you can do that now Email connectivity, Outlook Web Access is enabled, so you can uh, disable it. Uh, IMAP and POP is supported, so IMAP by default is disabled uh, because uh, IMAP is uh, uh, is an old protocol. We don't use it, so you can enable it if uh, for certain Outlook client or an email client you want IMAP. You can also enable POP if you like. MAPI is also disabled because now Outlook Anywhere is used. RPC over HTTP is the protocol which gets used when you connect to Outlook Mailbox. But if you want to enable MAPI, you can do that. Litigation hold is a once again a retention policy. So it's named as litigation hold because sometimes what happens is uh, a user's mailbox content are required for a legal case. Or a, or a court case and for those reasons this term is used here litigation hold if I go ahead and enable litigation hold on this mailbox then no matter user delete whatever from his mailbox all the data all the content of his mailbox will remain recoverable so user will delete it user will not see it but as an administrator you can run a e-discovery on the mailbox I'll show you how to do that and you can recover all the content of the mailbox 
So archiving is the archiving mailbox. So if you want the user to have the additional 50 GB archiving mailbox, you can enable that. And uh, you can go here and uh, put the kind of settings if you want to. You can put message sites restriction if you want the user to stop uh, user from sending really large emails. I think the uh, the current size of email which is supported is 50 MB, which is pretty huge. Earlier, the emails used to be a 5 or 10 MB, but now I think 50 MB or 100 MB of emails are supported. So you can attach a 100 MB file with an email and send it to people. Uh, but if you want to restrict the size, you can do that. Message delivery restrictions is possible. So uh, if you want to restrict the people who can send messages to this person you can go ahead and uh, do that here and you can suggest uh, uh, from what users you want to reject the messages so if there are certain users who this user should not get email from you can put their email addresses here and you can reject their messages this is not a setting which is used very often so that's there and Mailbox delegation is an important uh, thing which a lot of businesses use. So mailbox delegation is once again when uh, uh, the secretary want to use or Rita wants to use Sam's mailbox. Remember I showed you how Sam used accounting mailbox to send an email. So if you want, if Rita wants to send email as Sam so that the people think that Sam sent an email and this happens really a lot in the secretary and the boss scenario so the cio don't have time to send email to everybody so what the secretary does is that she sends the email but she sends it from his address and this way the cio or the world feels that the cio himself sent uh, them the email so you can give the secretary send as permission and you can give full access permission uh, and a full access permission the the secretary will be able to see all the contents of his mailbox with send as permission she will be send the email as the user and send on behalf permission is when the secretary will be able to send the email but uh, the recipient users will see that the secretary sent the email on behalf of uh, the mailbox owner so yeah I, I have not seen people using send on behalf a lot but send as permission and full access permission is very common okay so those are your mailboxes then you have got groups Once again, you can create a distribution group, mail enable security group, dynamic distribution list. So these are the three kind of groups which you can create. Distribution list is basically uh, a distribution list which you can create, say, uh, owners at, uh, at the businessname.com and you add here owners once again and if you have multiple domains added and validated you can choose them from here then if you want to put some notes here and if you uh, want to add members like Sam and Rita so you can go ahead and do that because they are the owners and then you can look at who uh, can join this group who can uh, uh, get out from this group so you basically say closed uh, so uh, these are the permissions they can only be added by the administrator and they can only be removed by administrator people themselves cannot join the group so we created a distribution group here and uh, once again one more thing which you should remember is delivery management by default whatever group you create uh, only the senders inside the organization will be able to send email to it again the purpose of this is that uh, you want to restrict uh, the external users from uh, being able to send email to your security groups it is better to be safe than sorry like I have told you that a lot of times uh, all the organization have groups like all employees at business.com or all HR employees at business.com or all 
uh, Sydney employees at business.com. So these are sensitive email addresses. If you send one email to this address, everybody will be able to see a copy of that email address. And you don't want uh, every uh, person in the organization to be able to send it. Like uh, I have seen that uh, there were certain emails uh, which were left open and one gentleman from the office, he sent a flyer of the nearby restaurant just to recommend that restaurant to the whole office. Now it's not necessarily wrong, but it is highly unprofessional. Why do you want to send a restaurant flyer to everybody? And uh, in fact, uh, I remember once they, there was a new club opening and they sent some photographs of that club and there was like really weird photographs of that club which they sent to everybody. So you don't want any such incident to happen uh, in your organization. So what, what you do is that most of the groups, you keep them only to the sender inside my organization, number one. And even further, what you can do is that you can restrict to certain people. So you can say that only San can send email to it. So nobody else will be able to send email to it or you can just restrict with a limited number of users or you can put a name of another group that only this group people can send email to it. So this is the restriction of the mail delivery. Once again, message approval, uh, sometimes you want that if an email is sent to a group, then it should be sent to a approver first once he looks at the email and then only once he click on approve, then it will go. So those options are available. Uh, you can add additional email addresses to those groups that's available. Group delegation is once again send us. Uh, so if you want to send email on with the name of this group so you want that when the email goes out everybody should get it from owners at business.com so you can give sam and rita permission here and then they will be sent uh, the emails okay Resource mailboxes is once again your room mailboxes and uh, equipment mailbox which you can create from here. Contacts are your external contacts which you want to create, mail user or mail contact. Uh, shared is your shared mailboxes uh, which you can create like accounting mailbox or owners uh, mailbox or new deals mailbox or resume mailbox or jobs at business.com mailbox so you can give and you can give a lot of people access to this mailbox uh, and everybody will see it in their outlook so i will go ahead and quickly create uh, jobs uh, or resume rather i should say resume so i am creating this shared mailbox so that the world can send uh, their resumes to it to get recruited in the company and the following user have permission to view and send email. So I will give Sam the permission. Now what's going to happen is that this mailbox will automatically show up in Sam's Outlook when we will configure it. And the best thing about shared mailboxes, and we use it a lot with a lot of organizations, that you don't need a license for a shared mailbox. So you can have five license in, in your company and you can create 500 share mailboxes without paying a single penny to Microsoft. Or you may have even one mailbox license and you can create 5,000 shared mailboxes. Imagine the amount of data and once again, it gets in place archiving of 50 GB. This mailbox is of 50 GB. You can put retention policies on this mailbox. You can put litigation hold on this mailbox. You can do whatever you want on this mailbox. And See, litigation hold is uh, available, uh, archiving is available, all kind of policies which are available on a regular mailbox are available here. And how we used to use it was that when people used to go from the company, they used to leave the job. No employer wants to delete the email of uh, an ex-business user. So what we used to do was we used to go here and convert the mailbox like John Doe leaves the organization. We will go ahead and say convert to shared mailbox here. And this mailbox will start showing up here. And then we can go to the admin center and then we will go ahead and and remove the license of this user. So this way we preserve the license cost. We can give that license to somebody else. And uh, at the same time, we preserve the the user's mailbox as well. The data is always available. If if uh, a user of the company or so we will uncheck this to remove the license. And at any point of time, if if anybody says that, you know, I want to see the data of that user who used to work here two years ago, we can go here and give the mailbox permission to that user, give, give him full access here. And uh, this user will be able to see the data from this ex-employee. 
So that's like an amazing, amazing thing. The migration tab is about migration of the email. We are going to discuss that in some later modules. So yeah, I've told you about user mailbox, shared mailbox, resource mailbox, distribution groups. Now let's look at protection. So these were the options which were missing from Office uh, from our Exchange 2013 installation. They're fully available here. You can play around. Malware was available there as well. You can look at the settings which are available. Just read about these settings, very granular settings, but basically configurations and uh, common sense configurations, you can use them. So they're available here. You can have connection filter. So connection filter is if you know that uh, there is a particular IP address, SMTP IP address, which is sending you a lot of bad emails, you can go ahead and uh, put it in the blocked IP address list. So this way, no email from that IP address will get delivered to you. Similarly, if there is a server, which is your own server, and you want no emails from it to be blocked, you can put that server in IP allow list. And no matter what kind of spam that server sends, it will get delivered to you. Spam filter. You can uh, define what happens to the spam email. So you can say move that to junk folder. You can say prepare a subject, uh, prepend a subject line. Like you, the subject line will get prepended with the word spam in it and the email will get delivered. You can say delete the message. So if it's a spam message, just go ahead and delete it. We don't want to see it, you can do that. Or you can say quarantine the message. So quarantines messages, I'll show you, they get saved on the server and the end user get a report every day or whatever frequency you configure and they will look at the emails and they have a button there to release the email. So that option is there. Uh, you can block certain domains here. You can block certain email addresses if they are sending you a lot of uh, spam email. You can go ahead and allow certain senders or you can allow certain domains once again a domain which is for your partner organization with which you want to accept all kind of emails you can add it here you can go ahead and add international spam so uh, you can say that any email which is getting delivered in Arabic or Bangla or Bosnian then go ahead Bulgarian then I don't want it so you can put it in spam filter uh, you can filter based on country. So you can say that my business is in US. I have nothing to do with Afghanistan, Albania, Algeria, whatever these countries are. And you can disable uh, all emails which can be received from there. So those kind of uh, settings are there. Then They have got advanced options. So uh, basically the spam get uh, categorized as spam based on the spam score. And if you look here, what we have done is that we have set anything which is above seven in spam score, you can send it or mark it as spam. So if you set it to four, then a lot of emails will get spammed. Uh, even if they are not a spam, if you send it to nine, then that's like really uh, relaxed. So a lot of emails will not get uh, marked as spam. The number seven is default. So the advanced option is basically it is telling you how to increase the spam score. So you can say image uh, links to remote site. If an email has image links to remote site, increase the spam score. You also have an option here to do testing. So what you can do is that you can do testing and it will send you a sort of a report to show you that if you enable the setting, what can, uh, what can happen and uh, numeric IP address in the URL. So instead of a name, if it is using IP address in the sender email address, then you can uh, do this. Uh, if there is a redirect to another port, then you can increase the spam score. If it is coming from .biz or .info website, then you can increase the spam score. So you're not necessarily asking it to mark it as spam. What you are saying is that if anything like this happens, then increase the spam score. And what you have done here is that you have defined a spam score. So if you keep enabling all these options and if they keep increasing the spam score then anything which which does like this will increase the spam score and here you are defining mark as spam so if it is an empty message mark as spam if it is uh, there is a javascript or vb script in the message mark as spam if there are embedded tags and read whatever options are there if there is a sensitive word list uh, in the message so you can define the sensitive word list uh, somewhere 
I don't remember where, but you can define the sensitive word list. Then uh, they will be mark spam. So your sensitive word list can include tobacco, sex, or or pornography, or whatever you want to include. So uh, based on those sensitive word list, it will get uh, mark spam. Now. SPF record hard fail. SPF is pa uh, the sender protection record, the DNS record which I mentioned to you. So if a sending domain do not have a SPF record created, then mark it as spam. It's easy peasy. Lot of people will get marked as spam very easily. So this is the sender protection filtering which you can enable on your own domain. I told you that to protect external organization, you have to create your SPF and DKIM. But similarly, to protect your own user, you have to start looking into other people SPF and DKIM records. So this is the SPF and DKIM which we spoke about during the exchange module. So there are various settings which are available here and uh, you can read the meaning of each one of them but these are the spam protection settings. Uh, you can set policies around outbound spam as well but they are saying that it has been moved into the NT spam page of security and compliance center so we can do that. This is the quarantine which I was talking to you about. So if you configure the spam filter to quarantine the messages, the messages will show up here, all the quarantine messages. You have an option to release the message from here. You have the option to whitelist your message from here to do a lot of edit. And uh, users will also get an email every day which will tell them that so right now I don't have any spam message otherwise I would have been able to show you the configuration schedule here to let me say I will say move it to quarantine. Maybe after this it will let me show you those settings. So once again this is a playground go ahead and make whatever changes you want to make to it you can't break it. This is a software as a service offering. You have no access to the backend control panel or backend server. Your possibility of breaking the things are very, very limited. So yeah, yeah, have, have a blast here. That's what I can say. Do whatever you want to do. From all the hard work which you have done in past, installation of the exchange server, management of the databases, creation of the mailboxes and all the minor things which you did. Now I hope you realize that how easy the cloud is, that you do really don't have to worry about the backend infrastructure anymore. You're just simply managing the cloud infrastructure from a user managed GUI. So if you go here and quarantine. Yeah, I still don't have any settings, but uh, when we will have some quarantined messages here, then we get an option here to define the schedule, uh, how frequently the users will get an email. So you can say every seven days they will get an email which will uh, have a list of all the message which has been quarantined for them and they can have a look at the email and they can release the messages or they can leave the messages as is. Action center has been moved to security and compliance as well. This is DKIM, uh, the domain keys, is an authentication process that can help protect both sender and recipient from forged phishing email. Adding DKIM signature to your domain, so recipient knows that the email actually came from the user in your organization and wasn't modified as they were sent. So this is what DKIM is. Again, we don't have a custom domain here, so I can't show you the settings. Otherwise, enable DKIM options comes up here and it gives you a DNS record which you can create in your public DNS to configure DKIM. Uh, this is a default domain from uh, Microsoft, so we can't set up uh, DKIM on it. If you had a custom domain here, you would be able to do DKIM. Okay, so now I will show you exchange rules. So you go here. Now exchange rules are something uh, really amazing. What you can do is that you can create a lot of rules for uh, different kind of messages. So let's say that uh, you want get an incident report when sensitive information is detected. So you name this rule anything sensitive info and this message contains sensitive information type select the type so you can 
go ahead and say that what type of messages so if there is a australia bank account number if there is an australia driving license number being sent in any email any email basically any user in your organization if it is sending uh, such thing in an email then generate an incident and send it to to uh, owners let the owners know that somebody is sending uh, these kind of details and add an exception what is an exception if the sender is which person is Rita so maybe Rita is allowed to send the sensitive information but if anybody else in the organization send Australian bank account number or Australian driver license number then send this report and you enforce it and you activate it and you create this rule so go ahead and Okay, so you have to put some comments here. Okay, maybe I can't create this rule because this requires an additional license. So, but I'm just giving you, trying to give an idea of a rule here to you. So what I'll do is I will go ahead and create another kind of a rule. So, apply message of 365 or I'll just create a custom rule. So you want to say CC message. So you want to say apply this rule when the recipient is resume if any emails comes to resume do this following forward this message uh, redirect the message or bcc this message to sam so basically if an email has come to resume then you BCC that message to Sam. You just created this rule. So now what's going to happen is that if there is any message which is coming to uh, uh, resume, it will got CC'd to Sam. There are a lot of possibilities in exchange rules. And whenever you have to do some kind of a crazy thing during the flow of the email which are conditions like a new kind of email coming in an email with a particular subject coming in or somebody sending some kind of email you can always come here and look at the possibilities of the rules which are available so when the email is traveling there is a lot of things which are possible and those are called as exchange rules i also want to show you this amazing console which is message trace it comes really handy if you have to troubleshoot something so let's say a user says that an email is not delivered to him or he has a not received an email so what you can do is that you can come here and you can say let's say sam is complaining so you will go ahead and add sam here and you'll say okay and you will say in past 48 hours just show me everything which happened in past 48 hours and you do a search now nothing has happened in past 48 hours otherwise all those emails will start showing up here and if you double click on those email you will see a complete pattern that how the email started and how the email where it went and how did the email flow so you can see the complete message trace here so this is a very good troubleshooting uh, uh, solution where uh, you will see the mail flow and you can see the problem which happened with the emails okay now connectors remember i told you there are connectors uh, the send connectors and the receive connectors in your on-premise uh, exchange server similarly you can create connectors here so if you want if you have a partner organization to whom you want to send uh, certain emails directly so you say or you want to allow emails from them without any restriction so from a partner organization to, to yourself, 
then what you can do is you can create this kind of a connector and you say uh, Contoso other company and you say next and it is saying that uh, how do you want to identify the email for this connector is it based on the sending domain name so if it is like contoso business number com, or do you want to use the ip address so if you know their smtp public ip address you can go ahead and put that ip address so let's say if the company is on premise and uh, they are next to me i will just go ahead and put their public ip address here and i will create this connector So these are exchange connectors or let's say that you want to create a connector uh, that uh, from your office 365 you want to send an email to uh, a partner organization or uh, to your own organization local exchange server in a hybrid scenario where half of your users are in office 365 and rest half of the users are here on your on-premise uh, mail server. So you can choose this option and you can provide the name external connector to my local mail server and you can choose the option whether a transport rule is going to send emails to this connector or all the emails for your accepted domain to this connector uh, or only uh, email sent for a particular domain so based on whatever scenario you want to choose you choose here and how do you want to route this email so you go ahead and tell the public IP address of your on-premise server once again I'm putting random IP addresses here it's going to ask me to validate it and uh, uh, we will validate the connector for you to make sure that is working but first you need to ex provide one more email address so that we can test it you are asking me to send provide an email address but you know it's going to fail because the ip address which i have provided here is um, uh, not a valid ip address so it's going to it's going to validate try to okay Okay, so this is, I gave it wrong email address. So what is my validated domain name? Contoso2301. So we couldn't validate the connection. Click on the details to learn more about it. So where are the details? Okay, here are the details. Basically, it is saying that this IP address does not exist because I just put a random IP address and that server is not accepting uh, SMTP 25 port connections. So that's why this connector failed. But if you had an on-premise uh, mail server, and if you would have put a correct IP address here, that would have been accepted and you could have uh, used that connector. So these are the SMTP connectors which you can use in your organization. Once again, I would say that this is the only place where you have the skills to break Office 365 because if you go ahead and create dumb connectors here to unknown IP addresses, then you can uh, break your ability to send outbound emails, All right? So yeah, that's that's some of the things which I want to show you. Now these uh, control panel is exactly like the uh, exchange on-premise control panel. Uh, there are some additional settings which are available here. I would uh, suggest you to go through all these settings and uh, get acquainted with them. But uh, once again, I will tell you that uh, uh, don't try to overwhelm yourself. The purpose of the training is to give you a basic understanding of these things and to remove the terror of these things from your head so get acquainted with these try to understand them more and more but don't get lost uh, too much or don't put a lot of pressure on yourself because a lot of these things are pretty advanced and if you give them time they will grow on you automatically you will run into issues you will Im implement solutions and you will 
learn more and more so yeah just just take it gradually and uh, get a hang of these things and play around with them okay so let's go back to the training so we did user mailbox shared mailbox resource mailbox i showed you mailbox delegation which is the send as permission full access permission i created distribution groups for you i showed you exchange rules i showed you spam protection settings i showed you dkm and spf settings and i showed you the exchange connectors so that's it for this section so here is what we covered in this module we signed up a trial for office 365 at contoso uh, we added a public domain to our tenant i was not able to do that because i don't have a domain available i encourage you to go ahead and sign up a domain and add it uh, you we go ahead and created some users we showed you how to assign licenses to them i showed you various uh, Office 365 admin panels uh, from security and compliance to um, I'll say exchange to SharePoint to OneDrive and we did a deep dive into exchange online admin console. All right, so that's it for this module. So here are your action items for this module. Sign up your Office 365 tenant. Purchase a public domain if you can. I really recommend you so that you can use it to set up your uh, uh, tenant domain uh, in your uh, Office 365 tenant. And uh, maybe later you can set up a website for yourself as well. That will give you some understanding of a website as well. Uh, not on IIS, but uh, basically wherever you are going to buy the domain from, they'll probably offer you a free uh, hosting for the year. And uh, you can use that to set up a website if you like but complete the training first that's a different uh, pathway altogether don't uh, get involved in that too much uh, validate your public domain in office 365 by creating the txt record create users in office 365 play around with various admin panels of office 365 log in as one of the user in office 365 using the url portal.office365.com and check out what are the options available to you so let me just show you here i'm logged in as a regular user like i'm logged in as an admin user but pretty much for all the users the uh, sorry I went to the wrong place so this is how the portal looks like for all the users when they log in for the first time, if they have an install uh, a license which let them install Office, they can install it from here. And if when the recent documents shows up, if they start working on document, the recent documents will show up here. And you have got options to the various applications which are available. You also have. Um, uh, this waffle icon here this is a very useful icon and it will show you all the apps which are available to you and uh, the most used app is of course outlook so this is how the outlook web access look like there's no emails you can start sending email and uh, this is your calendar this is your uh, people okay there are two emails cool so yeah uh, that's that's how you navigate between various applications this is like how it looks for end user the only difference is if you are an admin user you will get this admin panel access and uh, using this you can go back to your administrative consoles and yeah you can have all the fun here so create shared mailbox give delegated permission to the user do the mailbox delegation create and test some exchange rules like i showed you that's a very interesting part uh, and uh, i would say exchange rules and uh, office 365 exchange connectors are the two places where you have a capability to break the mail flow and cause issues but uh, yeah that's that's how it functions and uh, best of all uh, support is entirely free so if you have an issue just go ahead and do a new service request and uh, go ahead and write any issue i have an issue you basically put a correct kind of a problem here and uh, then they are going to look for some solution and they will give you some suggestions but if you don't like any one of them which we usually don't then you go ahead and you put your telephone number etc and your email address and uh, you submit a ticket and you get a call from them or email from them 
pretty soon and you can work out your issues with them so cloud is very easy guys and this was your office 365 sign up and exchange admin panel so that's it for this module and i will see you in the next module soon